good morning. Good morning. I forgot my phone this morning, so I was just talking to Sean for a minute. He said, I'm gonna at least I'm not preaching the sermon. <laughs> I have no time on me whatsoever, right? Everybody stand with us this morning. Let's just praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Praise the God of glory. Reading his word this morning from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we do give you glory this morning. 
that before the world was made, you were God. And you knew us and worked for our salvation even before you created the world. You loved us even then. We confess that we were not lovely, and we still aren't in so many ways, Lord, but through your Son, Christ, you've brought us to yourself. Would you work in our hearts, we pray, so that day by day our lives would conform more to his and that <coughs> sin would be less and less a part of our lives? We pray for brothers and sisters around the world, and especially this morning for our friends who are in a far eastern country ministering in a new city that you will bless them and the folks that they serve and cause those believers there to be strong and live for you and be a testimony to your grace even there. Thank you for our pastor, for our musicians. God, would you work through them and bless and encourage them, give them joy in what they do as they draw our hearts toward you through your spirit. Work among us and make us men and women who love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Um, I want to ask you to pray for a couple that uh, Howard referred to a moment ago. We've uh, realized we need to stop saying their name because of uh, our uh, broadcast on Facebook, and they do call it the World Wide Web. It is, it is uh, available in uh, any place in the globe. And uh, that family serve in a closed country. That means um, that um, the, 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 the government deems what they are doing there, uh, sharing Christ as an illegal activity. And I want you to pray for them and a whole lot of other families who serve in that same country. Um, because of the clampdown uh, in the city where our family, uh, who are members here, have been for 16 years, think about that, 16 years of learning a city, meeting people, building relationships, but it uh, became so dangerous for them to remain in that place that they've had to go to an entirely different region and an entirely different city and start from scratch uh, their ministry. But pray for them. Um, it's not easy on the parents and it's not easy on their, their children who have to make uh, new friends in a new school and uh, just learn all the things that come with uh, moving to a new place. But um, we're talking about intercessory prayer today in our worship service, and there's an opportunity for you to pray for them. Well, a couple of things that we want to make you aware of. Uh, two of these are um, related to some mission activity that you can participate in uh, by praying, but also by giving. Um, two of our newest, um, our fa uh, newest family uh, Steve and Peggy Haskins are uh, going to Uganda in just uh, a few weeks. Uh, they have a daughter who teaches at a school there. They're going to visit with her. But there is another school uh, and a church that they have a, a longtime relationship with through their church in California that they're coming from. And um, one of the things that Steve and Peggy do each time they make a trip to Uganda is they take a extra suitcase and they pack it with as many uh, pairs of children's shoes as they can get into that suitcase and uh, then they give those shoes away to the children in these schools and in that village. Uh, there is a tub in front of the coffee station uh, out in the lobby and you have a couple of weeks where if you have shoes uh, that are in your house uh, that have life left in them, don't bring old worn out ragged kind of stuff, but if they've got life left uh, and nobody else in your family is needing them, you'd be willing to donate those. Know that there is a child in Uganda that uh, would, would be thrilled to death to have those shoes. Um, all the way up to, Steve mentioned that some of the men love uh, the rubber boots uh, um, that they can use when they're out chopping uh, grass and, and uh, weeds around the village, around their homes. Uh, so if you have an old pair of those that still, again, have life left in them, uh, bring them and they will be passed off to someone who would really appreciate it. Uh, now, not a slide to go with this yet, but uh, Constance on your far left uh, is going to Guatemala with her parents' church, Journey Church in Raleigh. This is a medical missions trip, and Constance's assignment is to gather as many children's vitamins as possible and add to that 
scrubs. So any of you who've uh, worked in any of the health uh, field uh, who have scrubs, if you've got some that you uh, don't need any longer and you'd be willing to send those uh, along with that team, uh, she's going to also get a box or a tub out into the lobby. And when do you guys go on that trip? Okay, toward the end of October, um, the uh, Haskins are headed to Uganda uh, at the beginning of October. But those are two opportunities. I uh, hope you'll uh, take advantage of uh, being able to give uh, something to uh, each of those trips. The Apologetics Conference is coming up two Saturdays from yesterday, so September 28th. And uh, don't let the Phase 2 Young Adult Ministry throw you. It is open for all ages. So high school students... Um, uh, through the oldest of our adults, uh, you would benefit from this. There is a, uh, a small flyer inside your program, and on the back side, it shows you the topics. Um, it starts with a general session here in this room, and uh, then they are, they are going into some breakout sessions and then ending the day. Um, it starts at 1 o'clock. It'll be over by 4 o'clock, ending the day with a Q&A session back in the auditorium. Uh, it will not cost you anything to come, so if you have any interest at all in apologetics and how uh, Scripture can answer the objections of people is basically what that field of study is about. Um, hope you'll plan on being here for that. Next steps is our uh, Class 101, uh, how to... Uh, it's an opportunity for you to get to know the church and uh, what we believe and how we function, uh, what our history is and our future and um, we don't have a day set. We're letting you drive that. We just took a large group through 101 a few weeks ago and uh, know that we missed some people. If you would be interested in taking this class, it starts at about 1230 on a Sunday uh, after second service. We feed you, take care of your kids, and then you are out of here by 330. Um, just uh, check. There is a box on the front of your connection card check that you'd like to come to 101, and if you have any preferred dates, uh, we'll let you set the, uh, the date on the calendar if you're the first one in with uh, a preferred date. And then uh, they were here at first service, but I uh, want you to see a picture of a new family, uh, Patrick and Sarah Butler, their little boy Levi. Uh, they are new members here at Crossroads and uh, wonderful folks. Uh, he's originally from uh, Texas. She's from West Virginia. And uh, Patrick has just gotten out of uh, the Army and uh, is a student at Campbell. Uh, Sarah is a uh, physical therapist at Womble. Not Womble, Womack. New story with a W-O-M. Uh, so I was halfway there. Womack. All right, let's stand. Thank you for being here. You've got a moment to say hello to those around you.
never to forget that the safest place in the fallen world is to remain in the center of your will no matter where we are who we are with or what circumstances may seem to be looming on the horizon Lord I pray that we may stay in the center of your perfect will each day of our lives that we walk worthy of the calling and live in a way that is pleasing to you help us Lord to walk by faith each moment of the day and not be swayed by sight or feelings or emotions. And may we learn to trust your word more and more with each passing day, knowing that without faith, without faith it is impossible to please you. For it is our heart's desire and that all we do and say we may be pleasing in your sight. Lord, may, may we live in a right relationship with you, walk humbly before you all the days of our lives. And pray that we may develop an attitude of grateful praise and thanksgiving. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable to you. And that my conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. And grant me wisdom, I pray, to know how best to answer everyone with whom I come in contact, Lord. With love love, Father. Sing with me. You are amazing, more than amazing, yeah, forever our God, you're more than enough. Sing that again. You are amazing, more than amazing, forever I got, you're more than enough, forever I
be seated. If you think about it, that song is a prayer, isn't it? It's addressing the Lord and uh, communicating with Him is what Scripture calls prayer. And uh, that's what we're looking at today, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Uh, if you have a Bible, open it. If you don't, but you picked up a, a bulletin, a program, inside of it there's a sheet that looks like this, and uh, it has uh, the verses from Colossians 1 that we're going to be looking at today. Um, one of the great uh, privileges of my life uh, have, have been those moments when I got to be in the presence of someone who prayed in, uh, in a deep and intimate way, not, not with memorized phrases that clearly were just coming out of uh, um, a, a, a mind and a mindset that uh, uh, went into automatic pilot when they were uh, asked to pray or when they chose to pray. But it was those people who when they prayed, you knew they were talking to God. Uh, there was an older man uh, in the church that I grew up in, uh, Fred Moreland, and I loved to hear him do two things. One was preach and the other was pray. Um, when he prayed, it was like there was no one else around, and that's a good thing. He was talking to the Lord, not to any of us. And uh, during uh, years of being at Southwestern Seminary, uh, there were two women that were brought in several times uh, to teach on the subject of prayer. Um, Corey Ten Boom, uh, if you've ever heard her name or read uh, any of her books, um, I, I was uh, uh, young enough at that time to have been able to hear her uh, on several occasions uh, before her uh, passing. And then there was someone that was very much like her who had been a, a missionary in China for most of her life, a lady named Bertha Smith. And when, when you heard these people pray, uh, you were changed. You were, you were transformed by what was going on in their conversation with God. Um, to pray for other people, it is a high privilege. Uh, I have a couple of quotes I want to read uh, to you as I'm beginning today. Richard Halverson for years was... Uh, not only a pastor of a local church, he was the chaplain of the Senate, the United States Senate. And uh, Halverson uh, wrote this about intercessory prayer. He said, intercession is the truly universal work for the Christian. No place is closed to intercessory prayer. No continent, no nation, no city, no organization, no office, no power on earth can keep intercessory prayer out. So, Ponder that as we tell you about missionaries who are uh, living under pressure in their places of uh, service. Uh, you can reach that community right at this moment uh, through your prayers. Uh, a poet and a hymn writer named William Cooper said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees. And, of course, what he is suggesting there uh, in, in a strong way is that God responds to the prayers of his people. And uh, that makes Satan very afraid as he sees one of us decide we will not just worry about a problem or worry about a person or be frustrated with another individual. We will rather pray for them. Uh, we will pray. If they're not a Christian, we will pray for their salvation. If they are a Christian, we will pray for their growth and their development as a Christian. Uh, we learn when we pray. We learn more about God and God's heart. We also learn when we listen to other people pray. Even though they're not talking to us, we can learn much about prayer by hearing someone who knows how to pray and how to pray on behalf of other people. Here's the uh, big, big idea for today, and then we're going to go into the uh, uh, verses for today's teaching. In a powerful prayer, Paul teaches us both 
how to pray for one another, and how to assess our own walk with the Lord. I'll show you how those two things fit together in just a moment. But he models prayer, and he gives us information about what it means to walk as a Christian. The prayer also masterfully explains what God has accomplished already for your salvation. So if you're not sure what Scripture says God has done for you to make your salvation possible, then hold on and listen uh, to this prayer that Paul prays. Now, uh, understand this is all, uh, basically one really long sentence. I think our English translations put in a period here or there for our own benefit, uh, but it's essentially one very complex thought. Uh, so you would be really challenged to diagram this thing. Uh, but, but I want to read it to you and just ask you to do your best to listen to it, follow along on the screen or down uh, in the Bible in your lap, and uh, then we will see how all this uh, breaks out and teaches us about prayer and about being a Christian man or woman. Paul picks up in verse 9 with these words, And so from the day we heard. So clearly he's referring back to something else that's already happened or that has already been said. And what that is, is that he has heard about the fact that there is now a church in Colossae. He only knows two people in the city. Uh, one is on their way back and escaped a runaway slave, and he's sending him back with a couple of letters. And the other is the pastor of this church who Paul seems to have led to the Lord, to a relationship with Christ. But he has heard from them that there is now a small church in Colossae. And remember, if you were here last week, we talked about the fact that Colossae is um, a diminished town. Uh, it was once larger. It was stronger, more significant in the trade routes of the day. And it has just seen its better days. But in that city, like in every city, whether it's thriving or diminishing, there are people who call it home. Uh, this is their, their place. This is where they live. And Paul writes to them and he says, I want you to know I've been praying for you. In fact, I haven't stopped praying for you since I heard that there were Christians in this place. We've not ceased to pray for you, asking, what does he pray for them? Here he's about to reveal it. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His saints in, in the light, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So, we get to, like I did as a young student, listen in on the mature prayers of someone who's walked with Christ for a long time. What do we learn by looking at, a, at an apostle's prayer for Christian growth, would first just notice this is not anything new for Paul. This is a pattern of his life. Uh, just specifically in relationship to that church, to that city, to the residents there, Paul says, I have been praying for you, and I will keep praying for you. I have not stopped praying. So he prays with persistence. Paul's circumstances give him maybe some extra time. Maybe he has a time advantage over your schedule. After all, he's under house arrest. You know, one of the things, think of this. One of the things you and I could pray, though we've not met most of us, not met anyone who works down the road, 
uh, what, about a mile, there is a medium security prison. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of inmates there. And, and that is their world. That is the life that they live. They live in a small, confined space, and they get out for meals and some activities and maybe to take a class or two. But they are in a time of life where they have an enormous amount of time to think if they choose to do so. What if you and I started praying for those men? What if we started praying for the staff at that prison? For the corrections officers, for the teachers, for the administrators of that prison? Well, Paul's on the other side of this. He's a Christian in prison. And he has much time to choose what he will think about. And what he has chosen is to spend as much time as possible praying for people, some of, which, some of whom he knows and some of whom he, he's just heard about. He just knows of them. But he says, I pray for you. I pray for you. What a gift for someone to say and to mean it. I pray for you faithfully, regularly. He prays in particular, besides praying uh, with persistence, he prays in particular ways for uh, certain things that they need that he asks God to provide or to give them. Uh, I had a preaching professor in college, James Shields. He was a brilliant man who liked to pretend to be a country bumpkin. And uh, he pulled it off. And, and, and uh, he had that country persona, but you, you didn't have to talk to him very long to realize this guy's brilliant. And, and in his strongest possible country twang, he said to a bunch of 18, 19, 20-year-old uh, preachers, most of us, or a lot of us, had small country churches that we were preaching at on the weekends. He said, gentlemen, you got to quit preaching those guat sermons. And of course, none of us knew what a, a guat sermon was. He said, that's an abbreviation for God, the world, and other things. He said, some of you are standing up every week, and instead of dealing with the, the beautiful scripture, the text that's before you, you just start talking to fill time. And you talk a little bit about God, and a little bit about the world, and a whole bunch about other things. And so he coached us, quit doing that, become focused on what God has said. Well, it dawned on me this week, some of us pray guat prayers. God, thank you for all your gifts. We pray for all those in need around the world. Be with all your missionaries. Thank you for this food. Amen. A God, the world, and other things. When you read Paul's prayer, you see he doesn't pray that way. He prays in very particular ways for these people, again, most of whom he does not know. But he knows they are claiming to know Christ. So what do they need? What do Christian people need in any community, in any church? Look at how he prays. He prays that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will. In every time, every time in history, in every community, in every country, people are wrestling with decisions trying to figure out what is the best way to go, this way or that way. And so Paul prays, God, as your people make decisions today, would you fill them with the knowledge of your will? Now, if, as we often say here at Crossroads, God's will is found in God's Word, what does that also mean? It suggests that I need to pray that they will turn to God's Word and find out what God's will is and, and see that that is often very different from what their friend's will or their friend's guidance might be. Uh, he also prays that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You see that in verse 10? We've not ceased to pray for you, that you'll be filled with the knowledge of His will, with spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that are so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You see, the perspective of Scripture is that I never get to divorce my beliefs from my behavior. 
I do not get to separate what God says in His Word with what God's will is for my life. God brings these things together. And so Paul prays in that manner. Lord, help them to not only know your heart and your mind, your word, but then help them to put that into practice so that in their living, in their walking, their lives reflect what your will is. See how rich the prayer becomes when you start to, to really give it thought, to, to, to give it consideration? Uh, the perspective of his culture that Paul writes uh, from and into, the Greek culture over in Colossae, was that um, you just need to appreciate learning for learning's sake, knowledge for knowledge's sake. And what Paul brings to that discussion is, no, when it comes to God, you're not just stacking up facts and information about God and information about Scripture. Every truth you learn about God in His Word is a revelation about who God is. You get to see His heart. You get to see His being. So we don't just study Scripture so that we can say, yeah, that was a really wonderful study of the book of Romans. A lot of good doctrine there. No, we get to study Romans to find out who God is, how God thinks, how God acts, what God has done for people. So we bring belief and behavior together, creed and conduct together. And Paul prays for them not knowing much about what their particular circumstances were. When is the right time to pray for a brother or a sister? Right now. Regardless. Don't, don't wait on a catastrophe to uh, hit their life. Don't, don't wait on a, a fresh report to know exactly what they're going through right at this moment or during this time in their life. If God brings someone to your mind, to my mind, it's an appropriate time to pray for them. C.S. Lewis wrote a lot of letters in his day, and someone went through and collected many of those. He wrote a friend uh, named Penelope Lawson one time, and he said, I especially need your prayers now. And you would brace, I would brace for what's next. What's he about to tell me? Is, is going on that, that he's struggling with. But that's not what he said. I especially need your prayers now, my friend, because I am like the pilgrim in Bunyan, uh, the book Pil Pilgrim's Progress. He said, I'm like the pilgrim in Bunyan. I'm traveling across a plain called Ease, E-A-S-E. -E. What he said was, my life is going so well right now, I'm a little concerned we let our guards down when things are going well. Most of us get on our knees when things are not going well. C.S. Lewis knew himself well enough to know that it was in the moments of ease, in the moments when things were, were, were going along very smoothly in his life, that he was probably at the most danger spiritually. And so he asked this Christian uh, friend of his to pray especially for him at that moment, he adds this to his letter, everything without and many things within are marvelously well at present. Uh, I need your prayers. It's a really good perspective to keep in mind. Now, what is this life? If you look at how Paul is, is praying here, he has left us with this thought in verse 10 that he is praying that we would live a life worthy of the Lord. That our walk, which is a, a, a biblical uh, word to, to describe what it's like to live with God. In the New Testament, we start to, to, to think in terms of walking with Christ, walking with Jesus. What does that life look like? A life that's fully pleasing to Him. And that's what I'm going to take the bulk of the remaining time to try to explain. Look at the middle of verse 10. The life fully pleasing to him, that is a, a life worthy of the Lord, is one where we are bearing fruit in every good work. His exact words. Bearing fruit in every good work. 
Last week, I think in this service, I mentioned my plum tree that had been kind of dormant for more than a decade, and it came to life this year uh, with a bumper crop. Uh, you know how I know that's a plum tree? This is, this is not rocket science. This is not a trick question. I know it's a plum tree because it produced plums. Okay? Very simple, logical deduction that we can make. I know it's not a peach tree because it didn't put off any peaches. I know it's not a grapevine because it's never produced a grape. It is a plum tree. Paul, in a different letter, writes that there is a fruit that the Christian should be seeing develop in our lives. And that other people, whether they are Christian or not, ought to observe in our lives. He writes about this in Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, and notice he uses singular fruit. Uh, sometimes you notice plaques if you're ever in a gift shop uh, that has Christian uh, uh, products. Uh, and sometimes they misquote this and put an S on the end of it, the fruits of the Spirit. No, it's singular. The fruit of the Spirit. And then he gives us nine things. That fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of that is the product of the Holy Spirit within a Christian man or woman. And if you look at my life and I claim to be a Christian, but you see none of that, you have right to question my relationship with God. And by the way, the, the singular there, the fruit of the Spirit is all of these things, means I don't get to pick and choose. I used to love those exams when I had a teacher or a professor who would say, okay, here are nine questions, work four of them. Man, I, I, I could pass those because I could find four that I knew how to work and leave off the five that I was going to have trouble with. God doesn't present us nine things, and he says, you can do a few of these. Rather, he says, the singular fruit of the Spirit in your life is all of this. This is, this is, this is the Jesus life that you, you claim lives in you. Jesus lives in you. This is what he looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And so Paul prays for people he's never met, and he says, I know what I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that you will be bearing fruit. That when people bump up against you in life, they knock off the fruit of the Spirit. What comes out of you is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, that fruit is expressed he says often in good things that we do good works uh, paul loved to teach about good works in ephesians 2 8 and 9 he declares without uh, any hesitation that that we are off track if we think we are saved by good works and that's why he says for by grace you've been saved through faith and, and the, he says, now that faith, even that, is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. And then he launches immediately after, after making sure we understand we are saved by a gift from God, not by what we do. He says, but, listen to me, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So I'm not saved by my good works, but I'm saved for or to do good works. Uh, which he says, you, you ought to think about this for a moment. God prepared beforehand for us to do, to walk in those. Do you know God already knows your schedule and the conversations you're going to have this next week? Think about that. We're going to be surprised, shocked, appalled. All of those things. 
And, and God's already planned them out for us. And along with that, he has planned out opportunities to do good for each one of us who is a Christian. And so Paul prays in that way. God, I, I pray that, that my friends that I hope one day to meet will walk in a manner worthy of you bearing fruit in every good work. The second thing he says that, ex that explains what this uh, life that is fully pleasing to him is increasing, he says, in the knowledge of God. He talks about this a lot, repeatedly. He comes back to the subject of knowing God. Now, part of that's driven by some of the false teachings that have infiltrated the church and the community in Colossae. There were a group of people there called the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. It's built off the word gnosis, Greek for knowledge. And these were people who claimed an extra level of knowledge of God that the average person just couldn't have. And uh, they, they, their attitude was, we know things you don't know. If you'll become one of us, we'll let you know what the secret handshake is and and we'll tell you the secrets that we are keeping uh, just for people uh, who, who know the secret handshake. Yeah, I mean, that's making fun of it, but that's the mentality of the Gnostics. What Paul does is he comes in here and he says, wait a minute. If you want to know God, put your faith in Christ. If you want to know God, dive into the Word of God. And as you increase your knowledge of God, He will gladly open up who He is so that, that, that there are no hidden secrets. You are gaining, along with the, 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 the greatest scholars of your day and the most simple, uneducated people of your community, you are right there all together and nobody has an advantage over the other because God loves to make himself known. God reveals himself. And Paul prays for that. That, that these Christians would increase. That they wouldn't get stuck. You ever known someone that got stuck at an early reading level? And it frustrated them and it frustrated friends who, who loved them. That they just couldn't develop past where they got to. Paul says, I don't want you to get stuck in your knowledge of God. I want you to be increasing every day. That's the richness of those 80-year-olds that I was talking about earlier that I got the privilege of hearing pray. They were not highly educated people. They were highly devoted people. They knew who they were speaking to. And that knowledge came from their openness to God in their lives and their study, their faithful study of Scripture. So Paul prays, and we can pray this for ourselves and for each other, that we would not get stuck in our knowledge. We would continue to learn who God is. And he goes from that to, to this beautiful uh, portion of his prayer. I pray that you would be strengthened with all power. Those are variations of the exact same word. So it's something like this. It's the word uh, dunamis from which we get our word dynamite. A rough, rough, rough translation would be, I pray that you would be dynamited with the dynamite of God. I pray that you will be blown away by the power of God, which you can't create it has to be something God does in you. It, it is a um, passive voice. and Here's the important thing about that. Verbs come in active and passive. Active is something you do. Passive is something somebody does to you. This is a passive verb. It means God does this to you. God is willing to release his power in your life. You don't have the power to change. You don't have the power to quit. You don't have the power to start. But God does. And Paul prays that that power 
of God would be brought to you and released inside of you to do His work. Now, why does God want to give us this, this incredible power? Is it to impress each other? Um, that's sort of what they were trying to force Jesus to do when he was arrested uh, just before his crucifixion. Um, Herod wants him to do some tricks. Uh, how about you uh, walk on water? Heard you can do that. How about you turn some water into wine? I, 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 I uh, want to see you do that. And Jesus simply refuses. The power of God's not a plaything. Look at the text. Look at the scripture. Why does Paul pray for the power of God to strengthen us? He says at the end of that thought, it is for all endurance and for patience with joy. Why do I need God's power? I need God's power to endure what I'm going through. And I need God's power to be patient. Endurance has to do with trials. So you think about the most difficult thing you're dealing with right now in your life. And you think about the one who's on your heart the heaviest this morning. What are they going through? What are they dealing with? Paul prays that the Colossian Christians would be strengthened with the power of God for endurance. Paul didn't pray for their trial to end. He prayed that they would get through the trial. So often, our prayers, my prayers, are God, make this stop. End this suffering. And the prayer of Paul is not that, it is God give them the power to endure this. To get through this and not give up and not lose faith. And then he adds this this thought, pray for the power of God for patience. That's primarily about our relationship, our response to people. Endurance is about trials, circumstances. Patience is about each other. And Paul is wise enough at this point in his life to know that it is beyond the human capacity to continuously be patient with all of the annoying and needy people that we're surrounded with and that we are. You see, I know myself well enough to know I'm annoying. My wife told me that yesterday. (laughs) I'm annoying sometimes. And when I'm being annoying, she needs the power of God to strengthen her to deal with me. I didn't hear an amen, Vanessa. (laughs) You see, this... Yeah. This is not always about the glamorous, about the miraculous, supernatural kinds of things that we associate with the power of God. Sometimes it's just the nitty gritty of getting through a day. And it's not above or below Paul to say, I am praying for you. My friends that I've never met, I am praying that God will give you power to get through this day, whatever your trials are. And I am praying that he will give you patience for dealing with those people you're having to deal with today. And the last one, the fourth one of these that kind of fall under this umbrella thought of what does a life that's lived in a manner worthy of the Lord. What does that look like? In verse 12, he says, it looks like this. You're constantly giving thanks to your Father. Giving thanks to the Father. He prays for other people that they will be more grateful. Isn't it easy to just slide into a complaining mode? Where all we ever do is notice what's not going well. What people are not doing for us. How they're disappointing us constantly. Every time we turn around, somebody's done something else that annoys us. 
And so Paul, as he prays this, this magnificent intercessory prayer, he says, I pray that you'll live a life that is full of giving thanks to the Father. How much would my life change and yours if before the first foot hit the floor in the morning, we had stopped to just thank God for some things and mix it up, make it different each day. Thank God for having a floor. Man, there are millions of people around the world that don't have a, a carpeted or a wood floor to put their feet down on when they get up. Thank Him for the little things and the big things. Wouldn't that transform our attitude as we start the day if we just reminded ourselves and thanked God for how fortunate we are? He ends his prayer. And it really flows out of the give thanks to God with reminding them of some things God has done for them, provided for them spiritually. And these automatically go on that thank, thankfulness list. What's God done for us? Number one, He's qualified us. That's not a word I expected to read in the New Testament. He qualified us. We, we use that term in all sorts of competitions, don't we? Did you qualify in your race? Did you qualify in your exam? Uh, we're, we're constantly trying to meet a standard. And here, Paul comes back once again. His thought is, there is something for which you cannot qualify. You have to be qualified. Somebody has to do it for you. And so I couldn't qualify for a relationship with God. I disqualified myself through my own sin and my rebellion against my Creator. And I needed somebody else to qualify me. So the completed work of Christ on the cross, it comes back into play again. Grace by definition means Jesus paid the full price for my sin. He lived the perfect life that I couldn't live. He's taken care of the cost of admission into a relationship with God and in eternity in heaven. He qualifies us. It's the only way you get to know Him. Then He adds to that, He delivered us. Has delivered us. Accomplished. He has delivered us. It's the imagery of the Exodus when the children of Israel were, were slaves in Egypt and God raises Moses up to lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. But if that's too distant, think of other pictures that have been painted for us, sometimes in fiction, sometimes in real life history. C.S. Lewis in a work of fiction called Narnia, the place where it's always winter and never Christmas. Always winter but never Christmas. Christmas never quite reaches as long as they were under that spell. Or think of the Jews from true life, from history. In the 1940s, already having watched millions of their family, of their people being executed by the Nazis and those who were able to hang on at the end, they were finally liberated by the Allied troops who walked up to those gates of the concentration camps and pushed the gates open and freed those prisoners, freed them from their torture and killing and a brutal dictator, and gave them freedom. Paul says, you've been delivered. Spiritually, you've been delivered. And again, it was by something Christ did, not what you did. And then another word, maybe unexpected to you as it is to me. He says, he's transferred us to his kingdom. As I dug around with that term, I found out, oh, this is, a, this is another historical reference to ancient practices when, a, when a, a superpower overwhelmed a neighboring smaller country. It was very common to take the entire population. This happened with a lot of the residents of, of Jerusalem when they were conquered by Babylon and Assyria. Uh, the rulers would order the transport of all the citizens 
for them to be relocated into the country that is doing uh, the conquering. And it's that same terminology where Paul now says, uh, you, you, you've been delivered, you've been qualified, you've been delivered. And Christ has taken you from the old kingdom where you have lived your life. It is a kingdom of darkness. And he has transferred you into a kingdom of light. You used to live with a brutal king. And now you have a kind and loving king. A different ruler in your life. He transferred you to that kingdom. And then his closing thought. You've been redeemed. You've been forgiven. To redeem is to buy back. Something has been lost. Something has a price attached to it. And you purchase it back. Paul says, you as a human being, you've been bought back by your creator. And in that redemption, you have been forgiven. Listen to how Peter described this in uh, his first letter, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish, without spot. When I was a very young preacher, there was a story I heard from a traveling evangelist, and the story was so good and it uh, was so used that most of us retired it 25 or 30 years ago because everybody had heard it five times. Okay, enough time has passed, and I haven't used it, I don't think, in 22 years here at Crossroads. So let me bring out the old dusty, wonderful story. It's about a little boy who, with the guidance of his father many years ago, went to a hobby store, a toy store, and bought a boat kit. And there was some carving and sanding involved and piecing the... Uh, assembly of the pieces uh, together, steps that they did. But the father made sure the boy did the bulk of the work. And when he had finished all the assembly, he wanted to put a coat of paint on it. So he painted it a bright red, let it dry, and then he told his dad, I'm going to take it down to the river and uh, see how it works. And so he goes down by himself. He sets the boat uh, into the river. The water is flowing and the boat sails beautifully, and it sails quickly, and it sails right away from that little boy. He loses it. He can't keep up with it. It gets away from him. A couple of weeks later, he's walking downtown. He's been pretty dejected about how that all uh, happened. Uh, and he walks by this hobby shop, and he sees in the window the boat that he had built. Somebody found it. Somebody took it to the hobby shop sold it, and now the toy shop owner is selling a, a beautifully built toy boat. He goes in, explains, I built that, I bought it from you, and uh, I, I would love to have it back, and the owner kind of stood his ground. He's a businessman after, after all, and he said, I'm sorry, but I paid somebody for the boat when they brought it in, um, and if you want it back, you're going to have to buy it back from me. Had a dollar on it. So the boy reaches into his pocket, finds a dollar bill, hands it to the shop owner. He walks outside and he starts to talk to his boat like it's a pet, like it's alive. And he said, oh, it is so good to see you again. I made you. I lost you. I found you. And I bought you back. And you know the tie-in spiritually. God would say to you and me today, I made you. I lost you. I found you. I bought you. Paul would say, now live like it. Live like a redeemed man. A redeemed woman. Let's pray. Father, as we 
close this study, we thank you for your clear word. For how you inspired Paul 2,000 years ago to pray for a group of strangers. And through your sovereign direction, you had inspired those words. And you preserve those words for us as Scripture. And by means of that today, we get to open our Bibles and see these ancient words and realize they are as rich and powerful and meaningful today as they were to the first people who heard them. God, teach us. Teach us how to pray. How to pray for one another how to look at something like this in Scripture and realize that this is a, a guide that we can use to place our life alongside and, and do an assessment of where we are in our, our walk with you. Are we thankful people? Or do we constantly grumble? Does your fruit fall out of us when we bump up against difficult things and difficult people. There's so many points of conviction this morning and my prayer is that, that we will take what you're trying to speak to us and we will hold tightly to that until, Lord, we, we submit that portion of life to you. God, I pray for anyone in this room who may not be a Christian yet. They have continued to trust simply in their own good works, what they can accomplish and do. And I pray that this morning your spirit would convict them, convince them, show them that it's only by your gift that we can be saved. Lord, take us, your people, and help us to make this world a better world because we take your presence into the world. Your way of thinking, your way of loving, your way of responding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and let's worship our Lord.
the worship team. I was telling first service as we finished singing that song that uh, I've known the song for years and it just dawned on me this morning. The chorus um, really nails clearly a biblical truth that you notice it puts it in two tenses. You've made me new. You are making me new. Uh, you are a new creation in Christ. That's a reality immediately upon your faith in Christ. But there's also a process where we're being conformed to the image of Christ. And uh, that's the making new every day. So think about that this week. Um, uh, we, we need to be honest as we look at our lives, but uh, realistic as well. And uh, transformation is a lifelong thing. It's not an overnight thing. Let's pray, and uh, we'll be receiving our offering. If you're new to Crossroads, Vanessa and I'll be at the back. We'd love to say hi to you before you leave. Father, uh, we bring our gifts, and we give those to you as a part of our worship. And we pray that you would help our church with that money and uh, with the people that we send it to, uh, to speak clearly the gospel uh, to those people locally who need it and to those around the world who desperately need it. It's in Jesus' name that we come to you and we pray. Amen.